And in the first lecture, what we're really going to go over is in logistics. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on computational biology and, and genomics. Um, if you could, if you could mute everyone, I'm getting some feedback. If you could mute, if you don't have a question, that'd be great. I have some power to mute everybody, but I don't know how to wield that power. So if you could just mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, and then today, what we're going to try to do is um, set, connect to a server that we've set up for the course. The name of the server is Malibu. I don't know why it's called Malibu, but it is. Um, it is a server that lives in the basement of the Eccles Institute for Human Genetics. Under normal conditions, you just if you're on wireless in that building or in any building on campus, you just log in. Uh, under COVID conditions, working from home, we need to have a VPN set up. I sent out instructions about how to do that if you don't already have a VPN. I imagine after a year off campus, you probably already have a VPN set up, but we have to log in to the VPN in order to log in to the network. Um, the university servers that aren't protected by the network have been attacked uh, routinely over the last few years, so they're really strict about that. All right, so jumping in, um, this, the gist of this course is really about, it's focused on genomics, but there's some, there's some techniques, most of the techniques and concepts that we're gonna cover are germane to other types of research. It's, it's broadly about, this course is broadly about the data science and the statistics and, and the computational work associated with genomics, but it, it fits to other flavors of bioinformatics or, or broadly um, data science. And the motivation for this is, is really um, over the last 20 years, especially in the last 10 years, biology, primarily genetics, but all forms of biology really, have, has gone from a very data poor discipline. It was hard to generate data. Experiments took a long time um, to a very data rich discipline which is a good thing. The, the other side of the coin, however, is that a lot of what we end up focusing on is the interpretation of very large data sets. And the thing I talk about all the time in my lab, and I'll probably use this phrase uh, throughout the course, is trying to find the signal, the biological signal of interest, um, extract that in the, in the face of a ton of noise that arises from um, technological errors in, the, in DNA sequencing technologies, for instance, errors or bias in the data collection. So trying to figure out, identify what is real biological signal versus noise. Um, and I think in my mind that knowing that that's the case, and that is true really of all science, especially genomic science, you have to go into every experiment the analysis of, analysis of every experiment, assuming that not only is one thing wrong, there's probably many things wrong with it. We have to inherently distrust the data that we're given and go through a series of processes to you know, undergo quality control, expect that there's things wrong. How do we identify the things that are wrong or the biases in the data? So that not, we're not fooled in this um, immediately thinking that the hypothesis that we pose is actually right. And so broadly, the goal of this course is to help teach you some uh, methods and concepts that will help you do that. All right, so the objectives of the course are really to teach, I've covered this, but to teach you the theory and fundamental analysis techniques uh, for computational genomics research. Let me just edit my typos in real time. Um, and so what I really, my goal, uh, hopefully I'll achieve this, is to leave you, have you leave this course empowered to feel comfortable analyzing data of this type. You're not gonna be an expert, this, this, there's too much to cover, but at least, um, at least I guess you'll know enough to jump in and know enough concepts to start Googling when you run into something we didn't cover. Most of what uh, people in my lab and other computational labs do, and you'll do this throughout your career, you end up 
Googling, searching Stack Overflow, looking on Stack Exchange, trying to figure out, all right, I've got this problem. Has anyone, has anyone solved this before? But those types of queries and, and your, your adventure of, of analyzing your data is, is empowered if you actually know the basics. And we're gonna to try to cover the basics here. So my expectations of you uh, are that you've already completed the course prerequisites. Um, that's easy because there are none currently. Um, but most importantly, that you attend every class unless you have something major wrong. I might assign a couple of articles before a lecture. Uh, none of them will be terribly difficult but please read them before the class. It'll, I'll, I'll basically be assuming that you've read it. And I think this is the most important one, especially using Zoom. Um, it's, I feel like it's a lot easier when we're in person to just raise your hand. I can kind of see if people are confused and I think there's a little uh, inherently a better comfort level for asking questions. Um, but if you're confused or, or don't understand or I'm going too fast, stop ask me a question, um, just jump in, okay? Um, there is a broad, I've, every, I think this is the fourth time I've taught this course. Every year, there's always a very broad range of prior experience with doing anything like we're gonna do. Um, and therefore for the homeworks, especially as they ramp up and get a little more difficult, um, some people finish the homework in a half hour, and I've heard some people it takes four hours of work or more. Um, I would say that if you work hard at, uh, on those homeworks and really try to stay with it, don't save it for the last day, it'll pay off. You'll, your skills will develop very quickly and the concepts um, will be less confusing. Um, but to that, to that end, I just want to emphasize that we have three fantastic uh, TAs this year. Uh, Sarah Lucas, Gage Black, both Sarah and Gage took this course last year. Um, and then John Chamberlain, who's a graduate student in my lab, uh, who's really experienced in this area and, and um, can help out quite a bit. Each of these TAs have committed an hour each week, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and one on Friday to uh, be available. They'll just be sitting at this Zoom, at this Zoom location waiting for questions. Uh, so use that. If you have questions or just want to go through some topics again with them, uh, you use that hour. And they're conveniently staggered before and after each of the Tuesday and Thursday classes. Um, let me get rid of this glare. Okay. Um, the course website is available at this GitHub site. Um, I think most of you have found this by now. The Zoom link is there. I've sent you the password. If you don't remember the password, use the Slack channel or email me. I can send it to you. Um, I want to emphasize that I'm, I'm restructuring this course a little bit based upon feedback that I got last year. And so I, I've, the, the first few courses, maybe through uh, first few classes, maybe through class six are finalized, but I'm playing with the order and the content a little bit. So the syllabus uh, won't be finalized until probably at the end of this week. I just haven't had a chance to, to nail it all down. There will be at least six homeworks, uh, perhaps more, um, but pro probably if, if more, maybe seven or eight at the most. But the way these are gonna work is just to avoid any confusion on the day that it's assigned, the homework is due one week later at 11.59 p.m. that day. And um, what I'm gonna be sending out is a drop uh, a box, no, drop, drop box link, I think, um, that you will just post your file, the results of your homework to that link, and it'll have a timestamp, and that's how I know when, when it was submitted, okay? Any questions at this point? Good, great. All right, now we are gonna go through a brief and uh, woefully incomplete history of computational biology. Just to give you a sense of, I think there's, a, there's kind of a confused notion that computational biology really started in the last decade or, or really launched with the, the Human Genome Project, but that's really not true. 
uh, math, math and statistics and computational techniques have been a part of biology really since, well, arguably the 1920s, all the way back to Fisher and other statisticians that made huge, huge advances in, in biology, uh, for better or worse, in some cases. Um, but it really launched, I'd say in earnest, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and that really came with innovations in being able to study amino acid sequences. So we recognized as a community that you know, proteins were the business end of the cell. That's, these are the enzymes that make things happen in the cell. Um, and so there was a, a really strong interest in understanding what the peptide sequence of various proteins was. Um, with the notion that if we figured out the sequence of amino acids, we might be able to understand just by the amino acid sequence alone, what the function of proteins were in a cell. Turns out uh, that's a much harder problem than was thought. Uh, you might've seen a couple months ago, um, a group actually just published a paper showing that they can with reasonable accuracy, like 90% accuracy, predict uh, the protein structure from sequence alone. That, I haven't read that paper. They haven't released it publicly yet. It was a huge advance. I actually, just as a reference, my first rotation project as a graduate student back in 2004 was to develop a support vector machine, which we may talk about later, to try and predict protein structure from amino, amino acid sequence. And I worked on it for 12 weeks, day in, day out. And the accuracy of that technique that I developed was 60%. So a little bit better than a coin flip. Um, and the PI I was working for was so excited because that was half a percent better accuracy than the most recently published method. And that was sort of my trigger to say, I don't really wanna work on this problem because it's, it's really hard. Um, but thankfully there are much smarter people out there than me that, that have worked on this problem. And there's, so there's been major advances in inferring structure from amino acid sequence. Okay, tangent, back to the point. Um, in, in collecting amino acid sequences from lots of proteins, there was, there was an obvious need for computers to, to analyze those amino acid sequences. The original approach was literally, you know, writing down in a lab notebook what the nucleate or the amino acid sequence was and comparing literally by aligning sequences uh, by hand. Um, but prior to prior to this time, there were academic computers, obviously, but it was it was really the the fanciest universities that had the money to pay for a large uh, compute. But starting in the 1960s, and especially in the 70s, it, it wasn't really a problem anymore. Most universities had a mainframe that you could log in and submit code to. And so there, um, in parallel with that was this explosion in the interest of using computing to learn something about biology. And really the, um, the man who gets a lot of, should get a ton of recognition did uh, for this and did, uh, with a Nobel Prize in 1958 was Fred Sanger. This was his first Nobel Prize. We'll talk about his second Nobel Prize later. But essentially, um, Fred Sanger and his colleagues sequenced insulin. That was the first complete protein sequence. And they did that over a span of 10 years, uh, starting in 1945. And this this really launched what's known as the polypeptide theory of protein structure. And that basically posited that every protein had a characteristic primary structure, which is the amino acid sequence. And then as you know, through a process that we know about their secondary structures like alpha helixes, and beta sheets, and that, that um, further folds into a tertiary protein structure. And then there's quaternary protein structures, which is the interaction of multiple proteins. So it's like, you know, fancy puzzle pieces that fit together in a, in a very um, characteristic way. And so building upon that, uh, Morin Stein developed a, a semi-automated sequencing technique that allowed, uh, basically enabled greater scalability to study lots of proteins. And that might sound familiar. I mean, this is basically the same thing that has happened with DNA sequencing. We can now sequence a human genome for a thousand bucks, roughly. Um, and in many ways, 
DNA sequencing technologies have become essentially a, a cellular microscope in a way that we can use through very clever um, new assays. We can study RNA molecules. We can study the interaction of RNA and other enzymes. We can study the interaction of uh, enzymes and DNA and chromatin and all these things. And we end up using DNA sequencing as a readout. And it turns out that we owe all that to another innovation from Fred Sanger, which was his second Nobel Prize, which is Sanger sequencing. We'll talk about that later. Um, we also know that you know the race to study, um, the, figure out the structure uh, and the genetic code, uh, really thanks to Rosie Franklin, um, whose data is shown here, was uh, um, stolen slash borrowed from uh, Jim Watson and, and um, Francis Crick, and that was sort of the key piece of data that helped them figure out this, this helix structure, the double helix. Prior to that, um, uh, others, including Linus Pauling, thought that it was a, a, a tri-strand helix, um, and this, this data, this famous cross, could only, for x-ray diffraction experts, could only be explained by a double helix. Um, I don't quite get that myself. So as I said, uh, DNA sequencing, both by a method from Maximum Gilbert and then by Sanger. Um, this was, he got a Nobel Prize for this much later in 1980, but um, we're not gonna talk about this in detail. We'll cover that in a, in a later lecture, but essentially he came up with this very clever trick of having at low uh, concentration um, nucleotides that actually could not be added onto. So essentially it terminates the reaction. And then you, since it's at low frequency, it, with very low probability, you get molecules where the termination can't, the reaction cannot continue. And so the DNA fragment stays um, relatively short where that, where that uh, reaction stopped. Then you can sort all those molecules on a agros gel and essentially read off um, the sequence by looking at all the fragments that terminated with an A, all the fragments that terminated with a C, G, and T, and figure out the sequence. And subsequent innovations use fluorescently labeled nucleotides so that you could use lasers and computers to um, scan these agarose gels and infer the sequence automatically. And from that, things like Illumina sequencing that we use every day are essentially really fancy modifications of this key innovation from Fred Sanger. Okay, what I'm gonna jump into now is, uh, when I was a grad student, was kind of an unsung hero of bioinformatics. I didn't learn about Margaret Dayhoff until I was a postdoc. Um, and, and arguably she was the first true computational biologist. She was exquisitely trained in both math and quantum chemistry and just got, super excited about trying to figure out the amino acid sequence of proteins because the idea was because of the theory of evolution, we would infer that if an amino acid sequence is similar between two organisms, the function is also similar. So if you could, if you could identify the sequence of an amino acid and say E. coli or yeast, um, and, that, and that protein is also present in human, you know, evolution, concepts from evolution help you infer that the function, if you can figure out the function also in those um, model organisms, you can extrapolate the likely function in human. So she became the associate director of this uh, biomedical research foundation. And what she's really known for is writing some very uh, amazing and seminal programs in a language called Fortran, which isn't used terribly often anymore, but it's what I learned on, um, to derive amino acid sequences by doing looking at partial overlaps between fragments of amino acid sequences. So if you only can sequence the first 20 amino acids of a protein with one experiment, but you get the um, another 20 amino acids from another experiment, if there's shared amino acid sequence that overlaps those two fragments, you might be able to infer that it's one contiguous for, uh, 40 or 30 amino acid sequence just by the overlap, kind of like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. They belong together. And these programs that did look for those partial overlaps um, 
expedited the assembly essentially of amino acid sequences from months to minute because this was really done by hand. Um, and Margaret also realized that these concepts had applications to, to amino or to nuclei, nucleic acid sequences and gene sequences. So we could actually use these overlap uh, concepts to figure out the nucleotide sequence of say an exon or an entire gene. And fast forward to the Human Genome Project, it was exactly this concept um, that was used to assemble the human genome. We'll talk about that later. Um, moving forward, uh, a former colleague of mine, Bill Pearson, uh, working with David Littman, uh, put together a program called FASTA. This was to allow sequ rapid sequence searching. So you've got some fragment of DNA from an experiment and you wanna know what it is. Well, by through databases um, that were collected by the NIH and other, other foundations, they would collect databases of DNA sequences and new amino acid sequences from various organisms. And what these programs, FASTA and BLAST, which I'm sure you've used, uh, allow you to quickly take a sequence of interest and search it. It's basically Google for a sequence. What are all the hits? in all the different genes and critters that have been sequenced around the world. And what the beautiful thing about that is the, the algorithmic innovations that Bill and David and Stephen Altschul and, and Warren Gish and Webb Miller and others, especially Gene Myers, um, that it made that process of searching massive databases of sequences very fast to the point where, as you've probably done, you can log into uh, blast, you can Google blast, click the link, paste the sequence in there, hit go. And in you know, five seconds, you've got a list of all the different critters um, and, and sequences that your sequence of interest matches. And that's all thanks to key algorithmic innovations from, from these folks. I mentioned Gene Myers. Um, he was really critical to putting together the, um, the algorithms that assemble fragments of DNA sequence. This also works for amino acid sequences so that we could take little, so essentially the way the human genome was sequenced in a nutshell was you fragment or shotgun sequence, you fragment DNA from, let's say we did a blood draw of me, got DNA out of white blood cells, and then basically you fragment all those molecules, sequence them with uh, Sanger sequencing, but you only get like little 500 base pair fragments but the human genome is 3 billion base pairs long. So that's, that's essentially like putting together a really difficult jigsaw puzzle, like a picture of uh, the beach where the ocean's blue and the sky above it is blue. Trying to figure out where an individual piece of that jigsaw puzzle goes is very difficult. And it requires having specific nucleotides within a sequence that, are, that distinguish one part of the, the genome puzzle from another. And that's really what's shown in the bottom part of this figure. Gene figured out an algorithm to look for overlaps between DNA fragments depicted by these blue and green arrows and chain them together. Okay, we got an overlap by, with this fragment and this fragment. Great, they probably belong together. Then this fragment and this fragment belong together. And therefore, by transitive property, the three of those all belong together. You can build and build and build upon that. The concept wasn't his but the algorithms to do that very quickly, you know, namely less than the heat death of the universe was really uh, Gene's work to be able to do this for real. Um, I also wanna mention, um, the last thing I wanna mention in terms of computational biology, and this again is ignoring lots of different innovations in this area, um, is what I would call the hidden Markov model Bible. This was a, a, a seminal book by Richard Durbin, who's a famous computational biologist at the Sanger Institute. Sean Eddy, who was his grad student. Uh, that's Sean looking much younger. Um, and two other um, folks that I don't know well, uh, but the, I understand the bulk of the work was from Richard and Sean. And the idea was this, they wanted to put together a textbook that explained how biological sequences, amino acid sequences or DNA sequences could be interrogated in a probabilistic manner, meaning that um, D 
DNA sequences, they have errors. We don't, these sequencing technologies that we use make errors. Um, when we, we try to figure out an amino acid sequence of a protein, there are often errors. And so if you're trying to compare sequences in the face of error, the match or overlap between one sequence and another is not a definite thing. It's a probabilistic thing. I believe that these two belong together with a certain probability. And building upon that, and this is where the hidden Markov models come in, we're not gonna cover this in the course, but hidden Markov mo models, if you're not familiar, really allow you to predict um, what is gonna happen next in a DNA sequence or the state of something downstream in a sequence based upon what you know or you've learned uh, upstream in the sequence. So for instance, if you're marching along a DNA sequence and there's some evidence that a particular part of a genome is a CPG island, there's lots of CG dinucleotides, you can predict the probability of that CG dinucleotide enriched region continuing or stopping, right? Okay, so we are gonna cover some aspects of what I just blew through in the last 15 minutes or so throughout the course. But the main point here is really not, I don't expect you to remember any of this. It's really just to give you a sense that there's a long history of innovation in computational biology, which algorithms and statistical methods and computer software have been a huge part of what we do day in and day out now. I mean, we take things like BLAST for granted. We take sequence aligners for granted. We take you know, websites and, and things like IGV and other tools like that for granted. What we forget is that there's a huge body of work that precedes that and there's a ton of expertise. Um, and I think um, I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Uh, when I was a grad student and postdoc, I think computational innovation really wasn't given the, the credit that it deserves. That's changing now, but um, I'm hoping someday a computational biologist will will receive the Nobel Prize because some of the innovations like BLAST, for instance, I would argue is Nobel worthy uh, given the impact that it's had on the community. All right, that, that's me. I will get off my soapbox now. And now what we'll, we'll talk about is this thing called Unix, which I imagine everyone here has um, used before or heard of. Has anyone well, I don't want to have people call themselves out, but is this, am I right that people have probably either logged into a Unix machine or at least heard of it broadly? Hopefully. Okay. Um, I haven't. You haven't? No. Okay. No worries. Well, you, you will starting today. That's great. Uh, learn something new today. I like the library behind you, by the way. Um, so, so Unix is not an acronym. Um, it, I think sometimes it's thought that it is. It's a, it's a play on this uh, pre predecessor called Multix, um, which was developed at Bell Labs. Bell Labs, most of the great stuff that we enjoy in our life, like the internet um, started at Bell Labs. And uh, this genius computer scientist named Brian Kernigan, who I'll talk about maybe a couple times more in the course, was credited with the name. Um, I don't really know much about other, much more about the etymology of it, but it's it's a riff on Unix. Why why Unix? I don't know. Um, except it's maybe a homonym for another word like Unix. I don't. I have no idea. Um, so definition two of Unix for me, this is where, like R, uh, I'd say R is sort of the parallel. Um, things like RStudio, most of computational genomics work and computational work is done on the Unix command line for a couple of reasons. One, really powerful computing, compute servers that are available at, at academic institutes, they all run Unix. You might've heard of Linux, that's a flavor of Unix. Uh, you might've heard of OSX on Mac computers. That's another flavor of Unix. It, it, it was developed in the 60s, um, but it turns out it's, it's just the most powerful operating system for doing this type of work. The second reason that it's so widely used in computational genomics or in biology in general is that 
um, labs don't have a lot of money. So most of the software that people use is free, developed by academics. And those academics develop the software using for Unix operating systems. There are some tools that are available on Windows. Most of those are commercial. And my opinion is uh, the community has very much moved away from Windows-based software. There are definitely exceptions to this. Um, but most software being developed by academic labs is written in languages like C or Python or Rust um, or Java. And some of those languages work well in Windows, but typically they're gearing the software to users that are gonna type the software into a Unix command line, which we're gonna jump into today. Um, and the last definition is that it's your friend. Um, it is, there's a very steep learning curve with Unix. We're gonna, we're gonna try to get past that learning curve in this course, but I hope that by the end of the course, you'll feel comfortable logging into a Unix environment and doing actual work in Unix and, and that you recognize the power that it has for analyzing genomic and other data sets, okay? I won't belabor the history of this too much, um, but I, th I th there are some, I think there was a, maybe it was in PBS, there's a really fascinating documentary, fascinating to me about the history of, of the internet computing software development in the 1960s and just this incredible work that was done by the early innovators in this area like Dennis Ritchie, um, McElroy, Kernigan, um, um, Don Newth, um, just incredible innovations. And, and I think what's so, to me, so amazing about this work is that we still use all the stuff they develop today. Very little of it. I mean, for instance, there's a program called Awk, which some of you may have used. Awk was, the first version of Awk was written in the 60s and it's still used probably a 50 million times a day around the world. And really very little has changed about it. It's just that good. Um, one, of the, one of the beauty, beautiful things about Unix is that there's this collection, any, any Unix server, including the one we're gonna log into today, has a collection built in of really simple but dependable tools that do one small task very well. Like for instance, one is called sort. And by the name, you might be able to guess, it sorts things. And, and for example, if you had a grocery list in a text file and it was unorganized and maybe grocery stores someday will organize uh, food alphabetically, that'd be awesome. Then you could essentially use sort to sort your grocery list. And then you could just you know, follow your list through the grocery store. It'll sort, it'll sort genomics data. It'll sort anything that's in text format. So that's, but that's all it does. It won't run a t-test for you. It won't align things to a reference genome. It won't, whatever. It does that one thing. But the beauty of Unix is that you can combine lots of different commands that do one small thing well to do very sophisticated analyses by combining these different tools that we'll, that we'll learn about. All right, so enough about the history and the boring details. Um, let's now switch over to the part of the course, which is always a little difficult, especially in a Zoom environment, which is where we now try to log into Unix. Um, I'm gonna try to use the participants tab here. Could you please, um, use the participants tab to answer the following question with a thumbs up. Um, do you have a VPN installed on your computer and can you log in? Okay, I'm just gonna wait. Um, and anyone that doesn't thumb up, I'll interpret to be a no. Okay, so we're looking pretty good here. Okay. All right, um, I see about half the class with a thumbs up, which could be a problem. 
Um, for those that don't have a VPN, have you tried and had problems? Could I hear from you a little bit about what's going on there? Um, okay. So I'm seeing a couple people, like I'm, I'm just gonna call someone out to ask just to get information here. Uh, let's see, Aaron Cafferty does never thumb up. Aaron, have you tried to to get a VPN and had problems? Sorry, I should have my thumb up. I did the emoji react and I guess you want a hand raised in the participants <laughs> portion. So yeah. okay. I do have it. All right, well, I'm, I'm probably not using the right vernacular anyway. All right, so, so maybe it's looking more promising than I thought. Um, Michelle, do you have a VPN? Gabby? Yeah, I have my thumb up and then it disappeared. Okay, all right, so maybe these thumbs or hands are Oh, I see. Okay. If you raise a hand, that stays up there. If you do a thumb, that's ephemeral. Got it. Okay, great. I think we're good then. This is awesome. Um, right. Okay. So if you could all put your hands down, I think you just click that again. Thank you. This is so much simpler in non-COVID times. Um, second question, I know everyone that has a Mac computer will have terminal on it, so I'm not worried about that. The, the wild card is those of you that are using a Windows machine, of, you, of those, has any, does anyone, raise your hand if you have a Windows machine, but do not have a program called PuTTY yet. All right. This may be easy, famous last words. Okay, it looks like, do I infer that everyone has a OS X machine or should I infer that people have, a, some people have Windows but have Putty? Okay, all right, we'll, we'll move on here. So, let me just, uh, sorry, I'm minimizing, trying to minimize my screen. Right, so there are two ways to log in. Uh, it seems like the majority of people are gonna be using the example on the left, which is the terminal in OS X, and then on the right is PuTTY. So just a little bit about what these things are before we start using them. Um, this is, when, when I was in uh, undergrad, this is what my professors called a dumb terminal. And the dumb is not because it's, it's um, not useful or, or bad in any way. It's the, the dumb is meant to mean that it doesn't do anything. It's just a connection to another computer, either a connection to the computer that you're using or, or in the case of what we're gonna do, a connection to another computer. And there's this, it's just a, it's, it's also dumb in the sense that it's got this prompt, this dollar sign right here. I have no idea what this, I don't, I, I just pulled this off the internet. I don't know why it's called this, but um, the dollar sign is the prompt. And essentially this is a computer sitting here bored to death and it's waiting for you to tell it to do something. It's got this CPU just like fired up to, to do stuff for you and be your friend and help you but you have to tell it what to do. So our interaction with this server called Malibu is gonna be facilitated by using terminal for most of you or putty for the Windows users to issue commands to Malibu. So essentially what we're gonna do over the next few minutes, just to give you a sense of this, we are gonna use a command to log in to Malibu using your unit and your password and when we log in to Malibu, nothing magical is gonna happen on your screen. It's basically you're just gonna give you a new prompt and you'll just have to, know, and it'll probably update the, um, the title bar here to say what computer you're on. But again, it's just a dumb prompt and you are connecting, you have a uh, internet connection using TC, TCP IP from your computer at home or wherever you are to this computer that's in the basement of Eccles Institute for Human Genetics. And the prompt is you interacting with Unix. 
essentially you have logged into a Unix machine and that computer Malibu is waiting for you to ask it to do things. And what's really cool about a computer like Malibu is I guess there's probably like maybe 30 or 40 of us on this call right now. It can, it can handle requests from 30 of us at a time. There's gonna be 30 different connections to this machine and I can be issuing a command, Hannah, Kevin, Linda, Michelle, everyone can be typing commands and it's like, no problem, got it. Keep them coming. It's a, it's a nice, relatively powerful machine. Any questions about that? I imagine this is sort of a repeat for many of you. You've probably done this before, um, but any, any confusion at this point? Okay. So this prompt, as I mentioned, this is, um, this is how you interact with it. The one thing I wanna mention is that the prompt in Unix is very literal. It's not, another way that it's dumb is that if you type, I'm a terrible typer. So I know that I wanna sort a file, but I probably will write something like um, Dort or something like that because I typed the wrong key rather than S-O-R-T, I type D-O-R-T. And if I hit enter, it's gonna say, I have no idea what you're talking about. It'll say things like command not found. It doesn't infer what you mean. It's not like Siri. It's nothing like that. It's you, so part of the learning curve is getting the syntax of how you issue a command to Unix just right. So you're gonna learn very quickly that if you don't put a space in the right place, won't work. If you put art commands in the wrong order, won't work. If you misspell things, that's probably more intuitive won't work. Um, but once you get, um, once you get those, get past that syntax problem, um, things start to go more smoothly. All right, so I got something in the chat. Uh, so Kevin saying I installed it, but it needs an extension in my browser or something. So when you say it, Kevin, what, what did you install? Um, I installed the Cisco AnyConnect, the secure mobility client. Um, uh -huh. But I guess I just don't know how to use it. Uh, Sarah's kind of helping me out with it right now. Okay, I'm gonna, um, so did you did you go through the installation where you have the Cisco Any Connect software on your computer? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll show what I do. Um, another student in the course I were, helped, with, helped over the weekend had an issue, um, I forget her name, um, but she ended up, uh, I think it was Eva or Ava, I don't know how to say the name right. Um, had to call the help desk, I believe, to sort something out. Um, hopefully it's easier than that for you. Um, but yeah, sorry, hopefully we can sort that out today. That's all good, thank you. Yep, right on. Okay, so this is the prompt, this is the terminal. Well, how do we get to this thing? How do we get this? This is just a piece of software that allows you to connect um, to the internet or to a server. In on OS X, I think this is true of the latest versions. I don't, I don't know if I have the latest, but you would go to applications, then to utilities, and then to terminal. If you click on that, it should launch something like this. So I'm just gonna take a second and let everyone do that. What I would recommend too, um, if you're lazy like me, is once that's launched, right click on that application, the terminal icon in your dock and say keep in dock so that you don't have to keep searching for this every time. Um, let's everyone take a moment to launch either terminal or putty. I'm gonna wait a minute and just uh, in 10 seconds, I'm gonna ask if you, if you haven't found that yet and then we'll deal with that. Okay, has anyone not found either program? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone's very, very resourceful, that's great. Okay, so we can't log into Malibu yet because you are on your home wireless or wherever you are and that, that internet connection is not secure on the University of Utah um, network. So if you try to log in right now to Malibu, it'll, it'll basically say host name not found, which means I can't find Malibu. 
The only way you can find malibu.genetics.utah.edu, which is essentially the URL for this server, is by um, is by being on the VPN. All right, we got a few more questions here. Um, so, Eva, can you help me out? Is it Eva or Ava? Because I'll butcher this. I know I know two little girls that are my daughter's friends. One's Eva and one's Ava. Spelled and the same so way. It's Ava. Ava. All right. Thank you. Um, so Ava says to use Global Protect, which I think if you read the VPN documentation on UU is the is maybe the new one that you're supposed to use. Um, and Jason also, yeah, no, this is the one I'm thinking of. Palo Alto is apparently the one that's recommended for new users. They all should do the same thing. Essentially, it's just a conduit to get on into the University of Utah network, and you're just using your CIS credentials to do that. Um, you know, all right. So I am going to show you how I do this, but if you're comfortable already doing this, log in to the VPN. Okay. Connect to the University of Utah network via the VPN. Let me share my entire screen so you can see this. Can you see everything? Hopefully nothing embarrassing. Okay, let's see. So if I go, this is it for me. The key thing, there's two different URLs that can come up. One is for clinical faculty. So that gets you to like patient records and stuff like that. We don't have credentials for that. The one that you should be using for the Cisco AnyConnect is vpnaccess.utah.edu. If you've used one of these other flavors, it's a different URL and I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's on the Utah instructions. So for me, I click connect and I'm using 2FA or two-factor authentication. So for me, I use the duo push thing. I don't know what you use. Um, that's my user ID. I don't know my password. So you're gonna... Hmm. I'm gonna unshare my screen for a second while I use my password manager. So, okay, I'm back. Put that in there. And then for the second password, I just say push. I assume most of you use that same mechanism makes us more tied to our cell phones than normal. Um, and I get a push. And then what I should see is a success banner and basically saying like, play nicely on this network, on this VPN, don't do dumb stuff. All right. Please, if you're not connected to a VPN, I just wanna have a sense of how many people we might be leaving behind. I see no hands. Um, so if if you are actually unable, please speak up now, else I'm moving forward. Right on, okay, excellent. So we're all now connected, happily connected to the University of Utah network. Here's where having um, having access to the slides will, will help you, I think. So we're going to we're going to be typing our first command into Unix. Um, can you see my prompt right now? Can you see my terminal? Yes. yes. All right. I'm going to make I'm going to embiggen the the font here. So the command is ssh. So you should be typing this at home. Then your unit. So on the slide, I just say unit because I don't know what yours is. That's just a placeholder for your unit. I am known as 1007787. Right. And if you play chess, that's my chess.com handle. If you want to play sometime, let me know. Um, Malibu.genetics.utah.edu. Okay. So what's this, what is this command doing? SSH stands for, the first S is for secure. We want this to be a secure connection so that we don't get hacked or people can't 
track what our passwords and stuff like that because we're about to type a password in. Um, we then, the second part of SSH is the, the, the SH at the end stands for shell. So this, that prompt, when you, when you're, when you have a prompt uh, via Unix, you're, you're running a shell and the shell is nothing more than the environment that you're using to communicate with a particular server. So essentially what we're saying is I want to create a secure shell with this machine, this remote machine called malibu.genetics.utah.edu. But to log in, um, my, the username that I have on my computer, on my Mac that I'm using right now is Aaron Quinlan. So if I don't provide this username at the beginning, it's gonna try and log in to malibu.genetics.utah.edu as Aaron Quinlan. And there's no user available on Malibu called Aaron. So I have to use my sys ID and a shout out to the IT folks in the human genetics department. They went through and created user accounts for every single one of you on this machine. And the user accounts they used were based upon your unit. Okay, so you should have a command that looks like this. The only difference is the unit is different, okay? I'm gonna hit enter and it asks me for a password. This should be your sys password. It, oops, and I've already put something else on my clipboard. So hold on a second. I gotta get my password because it's too complicated. I don't have it memorized. Ah, I have an embarrassing mistake. This is the first example of Unix doesn't understand what you mean. My embarrassing mistake is, you can see my prompt. Um, my embarrassing mistake is that is not my unit. <laughs> um, it's not 77887, it's 7787. So it didn't understand what I meant. So now when I put my password in, I'm logged in. The reason I know I'm logged logged in, my prompt changes to say my unit at uh, Malibu. So I know that I'm logged into Malibu. The other way you can verify is by saying host name. This is our first Unix command. If I type that in and hit enter, it'll tell me what machine I'm, I'm currently on, okay? Could you please raise your hand if you've had uh, any bad luck connecting? Okay, we've got one. So Windows doesn't ask you for a password. Ah, okay, so you're using PuTTY. Yeah. Okay, um, let me go back to that slide. I think I'm logged in, but it didn't ask me for a password. Well, that would be very concerning. Um, not for you, but for the for the server. Um, let's see here. What might cause that? I no longer have my slide that shows the setup for Putty. Oh, here we go. It's down do. there, yeah. So, right. What it should do, I haven't done this for a while. I'm sorry, Linda. Um, so you have it set up like this. You put malibu.genetics.utah.edu in that host name field. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you put port, port 22? Yes. And you clicked SSH? Yes. All right. Um, and then when you click open, what did it do? When I click open, it just opens up um, login as, um, it just asks me to log in. I type in my um, UNID and then yeah. it just logs in without asking me for a password. Can you type host name and type type the word? Yes, in, I did. Yes, I typed host name and it says malibu.genetics.utah.edu and it has that thing. I think Amazing. Um, that scares me to death that that worked, um, but great, you're in. 
I don't know why that would be. It should be asking you a password. The only thing I can think of is it's inferring that you're on the network already and it's okay. Let me, I'm gonna ask the IT folks about that, but as long as you can type a command, you should be, you should be good to go at this point. Okay. There's some discussion in chat here. Let's see, how do I? Okay. Oh, Zoom. So Gabby says Zoom is freezing as you connect to the VPN. That's prob. Is that happening for other people? All I can guess is that your bandwidth is slowing down because you're on a VPN. And so it's sharing bandwidth both with Zoom and the VPN. Um, Okay, or Sarah probably is right. This is because you're switching your Wi-Fi source. Yeah, it, it crashed the first time, but now seems to be my, the Zoom seems to be kind of stable on the VPN, so. Okay. I think it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't really have great suggestions. Hopefully that, that gets better. Um, uh, Pavitra, hopefully I didn't ruin that name, um, not letting you add the password. Are you still having that issue? Yeah, for some reason when I tried logging in, um, right now it just said connection closed. Um, so I'll, I'll just try doing that again. Is that with PuTTY or with Terminal? With Terminal. And you're, you're confident you're, you're on the VPN? I am on the VPN and I'm also on the net, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm on the Huntsman network, but I'm also, I've, I've also logged into the VPN and it's still giving me that error. Hmm. Um, it might, in your case, it might be a conflict with the Huntsman network. Um, uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think we'll solve that. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to solve fine. that for you, but. Maybe just follow along for now. I mean, we're not going to go through anything crazy. The slides are here. You can do this at another time. Um, I, what I really want okay. to try to establish is for the bulk of the class to be able to log in because we're basically going to be doing something like this almost every class. Um, That's fine. Oh, yeah. So it won't show you typing the password. You just have to know it. Um, so at this Uh, so it looks like most people are in. Okay, all right. Well, then I'm gonna I'm gonna charge ahead and just try to cover some basics here. Um, right. So when you log in, you're you're working now with a file system. Essentially, you're on a prompt. You've got a prompt, and Behind the scenes, you can't see it, but behind the scenes, there is a file system, just like a file system on OS X and Windows. So there is, a, on every Unix machine, the top level directory is something called a root. A root, the, and I think, I think of that as the root of a tree. So a file system is essentially like a tree turned upside down, where the root system's at the top and you have these bifurcating directories that kind of span out. And you've probably seen that on OS X or Windows if you've ever clicked the plus button and see it expanding. So the root is like basically part your hard drive. And the, the Unix uh, syntax for root is slash, forward slash. Um, and under slash, there's a number of different directories. These are, we're not gonna talk much about these, but um, there's one for so-called binaries called bin. This is where software programs typically go. There's one called lib or lib, which is where software programming libraries go. But most relevant to us right now is there's one subdirectory, one subdirectory. Pardon? Oh, maybe that was feedback, sorry. 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 Um, so one of them is called home right under the root directory. And under home is a directory for every user on the computer. So in this toy example, so three users are Jane, Will, and Zeb. 
But in our case, I'll show you home. There's all these different directories. There's one, a special one for me to set up stuff for the class. There's one for Harold Nez, a nice guy that works in the IT department in our uh, building and one for Richard Haycock. And then you probably somewhere in here recognize your own user ID. So I am um, on here somewhere, but I can do ls dash home and I'll talk about ls in a second. And there's also there's directories and there's files in here because this is leftover stuff from teaching the course last year. But essentially, when I do ls, that stands for list, and that is list the contents of a particular directory. So if I type ls, it lists the contents of my current directory. And by default, when you log into a machine like Malibu, it automatically puts you in your home directory. So it automatically says, oh, your user, in my case, 1007787, you just SSH'd into this computer, I'm gonna automatically change to this directory for you. So that when you log in and type LS, you can see what's the contents of your home directory. Okay, so LS is literally the equivalent on a graphical operating system like OSX or Windows. If I double clicked, um, the Acrobat 3 directory on this side, it would automatically show me the contents of that directory, right? LS is the analog to that. There's no clickety clickety, no graphic stuff. You actually just have to know the command. But I think what's a, a, an interesting thing to know is that when effectively on, un, on OS X, if you're using a Mac, if you use Finder and double click on a directory, it is behind the scenes, listing the contents of that directory with LS and, and putting the results up on your, um, up on the graphic, on the graphic uh, window that you're using, okay? So this first, the first command that we've learned aside from host name, you can, you can forget that one if you want, we won't use it very often, but is list. And I, that what I want to introduce is most Unix commands have a mnemonic that tells you something about what the command actually does. So LS is just short for L-I-S-T. Now, why isn't the command called L-I-S-T? Great question. Um, the main reason is laziness. People want these commands to be, the original developers wanted these commands to be as short will show the contents of a particular directory. So as I mentioned, if, if we're Luke and we log into some directory, um, log into some machine and type LS, by default, we're listing the contents of Luke's home directory because what's happened magically behind the scenes is we've logged in and as soon as we log in, there's a special, a special set of commands on Unix machines that will automatically do things for you like macros when you log in. And one of those in this case is putting you automatically in your home directory, okay? So I would encourage each of you to just type ls in your directory. I would imagine you see nothing because you probably don't have any files in your home directory yet. Is that the case, am I, am I right? Okay, kind of boring, right? Um, we will very soon have lots of files in your directories that you're gonna be doing things with, but we're gonna start out with a, a slow. All right. Next, um, if we typed ls with a tilde, that's what that thing is, um, that's another way of listing the contents of your home directory tilde is a shortcut for your home directory. So let me show you an example of that. Right now, I'm in my home directory. These blue, these blue file names, blue indicates a, another directory, it's a subdirectory. So I can change directories, we'll, we'll revisit this in a second, cd into a different directory, say source, if I list the contents now, 
it's listing the contents of the source directory. And you'll notice that your prompt is updated. It'll tell you what directory you're in. So now we're, we're seeing new subdirectories. So it's like I moved into a new directory and I'm listing the contents of that directory. So you're sort of moving, you're navigating, or I'm navigating down this tree structure, which is the directory structure. But if I want it, now I'm in the source directory. So if I do ls, it's going to list the contents of that directory. But if I wanted for some reason to stay in this directory, but actually list the contents of my home directory, I can use this, this um, what's it called? Um, I want to say Sedia and Umlau, but that's not it. Tilda. Um, it'll show the contents of my home directory. OK, just a shortcut. It won't work if you mistype and you know do a single quote. It's just going to break it. The syntax it has to be exact. Okay. All right. Um, we can also list our home directory by saying um, tilde me. That's the same thing, that's equivalent to tilde. But the beauty is I could also list the contents of some other username. Unfortunately, I don't have permissions to do that, but if I did have permissions, I could type you know, somebody else's username and list the contents of their home directory. So you can, um, you know, if you're, if you're working together in a lab, that's a really nice thing. You, but however, you wouldn't want some random person that logs into Malibu to be able to look in your home directory, right? That's basically accessing your private stuff. All right. Now, as I mentioned before, we can also list all the users in the home directory. So we have to, if we want to go to the home directory, we have to start out by this forward slash, which represents root. And then underneath root is this home directory. Question. Yes. So if I type ls slash um, tilde, then your um, user ID, yep. should it pop up or no? Um, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what the permissions are. But if you can, um, well, what, what do you see? Do you see my contents? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, then the permissions aren't terribly uh, secure right now. Not very tight permissions. So let me see if I can list somebody else's directory. See, okay, well, I can't list your directories, but you guys can see mine. Well, that's fine. Okay. I reset my permission so people could access files for my directory to make something work during class. I've forgotten, but yeah. So that's a good example. In this case, my director, my home directory has permissions. We'll talk about that much later, such that other people can read the contents. Your directories, however, do not allow those permissions. So you shouldn't be able to look at each other's um, directories. Okay. Not that we really have anything to hide here in this course for what we're doing. Um, and then, you know, basically the idea is you can list, uh, as, as uh, was just shown, you can list the contents of other people's directories if the permissions are, are, are there. I've already talked about the CD command, but that stands for change directories. Again, that's much more efficient to type than change space directories. So they went with CD, which makes sense. Um, and this is literally the equivalent of clicking on a directory in um, on OS X or Windows. So let me show you a few examples here. Um, one other thing I'm going to mention is every lecture from this course is going to be a YouTube video. So if you forget some of this, you can skip through the YouTube video and, and go through the, some of the examples. I'm recording all of these and they'll be posted as YouTube videos for your reference. Um, and obviously the slides are available. But um, so I can, I'm in, in the source directory. I'm going to list. I can maybe now want to, there's a software that I use a lot called SAM tools. I'm going to go into that directory. So I type CD and then SAM tools. Now I just did a trick. I'm a terrible typer. I make mistakes and I'm slow. There's a special trick that I want you to know about right away. Here's a, here's a directory called examples. 
I could type CD space examples, or I could use um, autocomplete like on your cell phones. I can type E and then tab. And what it will do if I hit tab, it will look at all the things in the current directory that start with E. And if there's only one and I hit tab, it'll autocomplete it because there's only one thing that starts with E. Um, let, me, let me make another directory here as an example called MISD. Now, look, there's MISD and MISC. So if I type CD and then M and hit tab, it doesn't know what to do. There's three different, so if I hit tab twice, let me start over, CD, M, and then hit tab twice. It'll list all the things that start with M. So then I'm going to type I, tab twice. It, it knows that MIS is unique, but then you have to choose between MIS and C and D. So using tab for autocomplete, you can save yourself some typing to quickly um, to fix, quickly find the directory or the file name that you want. Okay. So I can also do this with LS. I could type LS BAM and then tab and hit tab twice and it'll show me all the things that start with BAM. So then you have a little dialogue here and you can double click and you could just paste those in. Okay. So I've showed how to CD to change directory into a directory, but what if I want to go back up in the tree? So I've drilled down. How do I go back up? Well, this is another thing you just have to memorize. This is the dot dot command. So we have to do, if you do CD dot dot, that's the equivalent of going up a level in the tree. So as an example, if we were down in Proj 1 and I type CD dot dot, we'd be back up in the loop directory. And if I type CD dot dot again, we'd be now up in the home directory, okay? Now I can check that with another command called um, PWD which stands for present working directory. And all that does is it tells me where I am. So sometimes the directory structure might be so complicated that you kind of got lost as to where you were. And we don't have this convenient graphical interface that shows us where in the tree we are. So PWD is sort of like, where am I in the file system? What's the present working directory? And that tells me that I am in slash the root slash home I'm in my home directory and I'm in a directory called SRC, which is underneath, which is a subdirectory of my home directory. And what's nice about the way things are set up on Malibu, the prompt kind of gives you a hint. It Any questions there? Okay. I've got um, a couple minutes here. I'm gonna show you a couple quick things. You can refer back to this. Um, future homeworks and things that we'll do, we'll, we'll use these commands. Um, so I wanna say two things quickly. Um, refer back to the slides. Almost all the homeworks have the, the content that you need is in the slides. There's a few cases where I ask you to go out on the internet and do a little bit of research. Um, the other thing is, you can log into Malibu whenever you want. Connect to the VPN, log in. You can try this stuff from home whenever you want, okay? Don't worry about breaking anything. You're not gonna break anything. And if, if you get stuck, reach out. Um, so the other one is make directory. So I've showed how to navigate into directories, but how do you create a new one? Well, I showed one quick example of that. Uh, I'm gonna go up a level, I'm in my home directory. And let's say I want to call a directory, make a directory called um, my new project. And then not project, project. Um, if I type ls now, guess what? We see a new directory called my new project. I can move into that directory. I'm going to do cd my and then hit tab so that I don't have to type that all that out because you can already see I don't type well. And if I list the contents of that directory, there's nothing, okay? One thing you can do to make files, I can create an empty file with a command called touch. 
And I think of that as like the magic touch and your blessing, you're blessing the creation of a new of a new file. So I'm going to create a new one called data dot text. That is the equivalent of opening like Microsoft Word and saving a file, but there's nothing in it or, or notepad on Windows or uh, I don't know. I don't know what the equivalent it is on on Mac, but you've created a file by list there. There's um, it shows that this file exists. But if I do, here's a new trick ls-l, which is an, uh, an option to the ls command. It gives us the details. And one of the details, this column tells me how many bytes are in that file. How big is the file? Um, it is zero bytes. There's nothing in it. So it, it exists on my, in my uh, new project directory, but there's nothing in there, okay? We'll talk about how to make files with stuff in it soon. So that's what the touch command does. And then in the last minute, I think I will just show this last command called head. If you are an R user, you might have used the head command before. It um, it shows the first set of lines from a text file. So it, the concept, it thinks of a text file as a series of lines, head being the first few, and then there's an analogous command called tail, which would be the last few lines of a file. So as an example, let's see if I have an interesting file here. Oh, yep, so I've got this tech file called frost. I do head on that frost file. Let me show you again, F tab, it'll auto complete it. It'll show the first by default 10 lines of, of that file. And this is a, a, a Robert Frost poem that you've probably read before. And I can do the tail of that same file and it'll show um, the last few lines, the last 10 lines. I can also give an option to the head command to say the number of lines that I want to show. So dash N for number one, that gives me the first line and that pans out because if we, when we did the first 10 lines, we saw all these, if we just ask for the first, it gives us that, okay? That's all we're gonna learn today. These are admittedly kind of boring commands. Um, it's mainly about how you navigate around in Unix and we haven't done anything related to computational biology at all. We've done nothing related to science at all, period. This is really just to get you exposed to the, to the environment, the Unix environment that we're gonna be using in class. Um, this class, just wrapping up, uh, I have five seconds. that you could do ahead of time if you don't have it already is also install R Studio on your computer because we're going to be learning some R programming as long as well as uh, some Unix command line stuff. Any, I'm going to wrap up there. Um, at the end of the slides, there's some cheat sheets. There's a cheat sheet for uh, other commands that you can use in Unix and you can print out that. There's a link to a PDF. You can print that out to have nearby. That, that would be helpful. Um, any questions at this point? I know we covered a lot today, but I'm actually kind of glad and excited that um, we didn't have as many issues with VPN as, as I had hoped or had expected rather. Any concerns at this point? Do we need to Sorry. do anything to log out or any weird thing to get out of the computer? Thank you very much, Talia, for asking that. Assuming I pronounced that right. So. If you're on, um, if you're on OS X in the terminal, you can just type exit and hit enter, and it'll say it logged out. Your connection is closed, and now you'll just have your prompt back. Um, if you're on Putty, you just close the window. Okay, there's no harm, no foul for staying logged in. Once you lose your internet connection, um, your your connection to the to the server will die anyway. Um, yeah, great question. Any other questions I can answer? Uh, I have a question about what 
happen if you ac accidentally make a typo in your when you're creating a file or folder? Can you change that later on? Yeah, um, good question. Did I? <laughs> I killed my connection. Uh, yes. So I'm actually going to cover that, in, I think, in the next lecture or one after. But um, if, if you create a directory, you can, there's a command called move. So let's, let's say I wanted to create a directory called um, dog and I wrote dot. And so now I have a directory called dot and I hate that directory. I don't want that ever to exist again. So you do, the command is move, which is the same as, is the equivalent to renaming it. So you would type MV space dot, which is the file name I don't, I want to change space dog. So you're moving it from one name to another. Um, I think that should be in the cheat sheet that uh, is at the bottom of the slides. The other thing you can do is um, delete the directory or delete the file. That's a little more complicated and I don't want to introduce that yet. But if you, if you accidentally type the wrong thing, you can change the name with the move command or you can just not worry about it for now, not a big deal. Okay, last thing I wanted to say is um, I don't think everyone has logged in to Slack. It's not a requirement. Uh, you don't have to do this, but I wanted to create a Slack channel for this course, especially because we're remote and the chat functionality in Zoom is so awful. Please feel free to ask any question there. TAs will be on that, I'll be on it. It's also for you to just communicate with one another students. Um, I will post links there, maybe post papers there. I'll also do it by email as well. There's no requirement, but I just find Slack to be a little lighter weight way of communicating than, than email. Um, anyway, well, thank you so much. Um, look forward to teaching all of you through the semester. If you run into any problems, if you have persistent problems with the VPN, let me know. Um, I think the help desk is actually quite helpful in this area, but um, let me know if, if, if it's still a problem. And if no issues, otherwise, we'll see each other on Thursday, okay? All right, take care.